Welcome into episode number one of The Rock Pod with the Royal Oak Chamber of Commerce. I am John Gay from Jagged Detroit Podcasts. My name is Lisa Bibby, and I'm your local realtor with Keller Williams Advantage. I'm Trish from your personal jeweler. I'm Andrea Arndt from Dickinson Wright. And today's guest is Jill Gleba from Gleba and Associates. They make wealth simple. Welcome, Jill. So glad to have you with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So you had told us ahead of time that you wanted to ask a question, but you didn't want to tell us what it was ahead of time as we start talking about wealth management and the psychology of all of this. What is the question that you have for us? So every time I present a workshop or seminar for the public, I ask everybody this question. I say, why is money important to you? And so for you and the people listening right now, Put a couple words in your mouth. What is making money important to you? And think about the answer. I would say for me, money is important because money is a vehicle to purchase goods and services and all the things that I need in life. To me, it's a vehicle to achieve what I want to achieve. You did a very good answer, John. There's three (laughs) possible answers. Uh, They all fall into three possible categories. So the first category is someone that is fear-based. They're afraid they're going to run out of money. The second answer is more, hey, I just want to pay my bills. And the third answer is, hey, I want the freedom to do whatever I want to do in life. And you answered it actually both, I want to be able to pay my bills, but you also said, I want to be able to do the things I want to do in life. Those are the people that understand the purpose of money and what it can do for them. And there's an abundance attitude in the freedom also, right? Mm -hmm. So the reason I asked that is because how people think about money and what it can do for them. Sometimes they're their own worst enemy in trying to accomplish what they want to do in life. I think about some terrible financial habits that I had when I was younger, but I know when I got together with my wife, she kind of uh, <laughs> you know, broke the wild stallion and whipped me into shape and taught me some much better financial habits so that I am a lot more responsive with my money than when I was single and spending it all at the bar, for example. I mean, there's many, many reasons. And I I ask a lot of people, why do they invest? There's a lot of people I've asked why they do invest. And a lot of times it wasn't from their parents. They were taught from maybe a high school teacher that had a stock contest, or they took an econ class maybe in college. I didn't learn about investing from my parents, to be honest. So it's kind of interesting. So, you know, I want to change the world in that way. I want everybody to know what money can do for them, how to invest, because The people that have enough money in life and they can take care of themselves, they usually have enough then that they can pass on to others and help others. So it all all goes around well. So Jill, why do you think people aren't investing? I think there's a lot of reasons. It's not all psychology, but a lot of it is some people don't invest because they just don't know how. They were never taught. It wasn't the norm in their family. I often wonder why parents aren't teaching their kids how to invest and how the money works and how they get paid and making mortgage payments and such. But when I asked people, they said it's because they're embarrassed because they didn't handle their money very well themselves or they feel they lack the knowledge. So that's one of the reasons too, is they feel like they don't have the knowledge to teach their kids. I get quite a few parents that they send their kids to me and I have a training program and that's very good. At least they're using me to train their kids because they just didn't know better. A lot of people don't trust advisors. Now, You see in the paper all the time about Ponzi schemes and people getting ripped off. So that's one of the many reasons too. And I don't know about you guys, but I grew up probably in a lower middle class family. And I don't know, do you guys watch Disney movies? Again, more so now that I've been married, but yes. (laughs) That's fun. (laughs) So think about this, you know, it's usually the person that's rich is old and greedy and mean. And then they come to their senses at the end of the story and they make the world better. But I think sometimes money is associated with greed, too. It's funny. I'll go to churches and speak about money. I'll say, listen, just point to Proverbs. And the whole thing is about money and being a good steward of your money. And just a funny fact, there are more verses in the Bible about money than there is about love. Go figure. And that was just some of the things. I don't know how you all grew up and learned about money. I don't know if you want to share that, but honest to goodness, I'm going to say out of a hundred people, I might get one person that says, yeah, my parents taught me how to invest. 
Usually I'll get a few hands up about, yes, I learned how to save. Okay, I know how to save money. But if I ask all of you, did you learn how to invest money? Did any of you learn that? Did anybody get taught that? Because I usually get no's. No, like I was taught how to have a budget book. So we literally got like a dollar allowance a week and we had to, you know, put a nickel here, a dime here and a quarter there. But we never got taught about like the stock market. So that was something Mm -hmm. that I learned when I was older and I went on YouTube and started learning about it myself. Isn't that something? And did any of you, did your parents share like, hey, this is money that we've made and we have to make mortgage payments or... I used to Mm -hmm. teach my kids when I paid with a credit card, I'd show them the bill and say, you know, that wasn't free money. We used the credit card. Now we're getting a bill and now we have to pay it. So my parents never did that. And I'm not knocking my parents. I had fantastic parents. It's just not their wheelhouse of knowledge. I remember having a checkbook when I was growing up and I had to put every single entry into the checkbook so I could balance it. But I think we're a little past that at this point in time. But I am excited that when my children get old enough that I can give them my knowledge based on investing and continue to learn from people like you. And I think there's a big difference between being taught how to manage your money, which are things like checkbooks, credit cards, versus how to invest your money. And that's a totally different topic that a lot of us aren't aware of. That's a good point because once cash flow, money comes in, money goes out. I think a lot of people, they'll get their cash flow, they pay their bills, and it just goes in the bank, and they don't think twice about it. And so when I do the old bucket theory, hey, now money, later money, and retirement money, let's split it up in those three buckets. At least visually, that's a little helpful for people. Now, that's basic, but that's actually a great tool so that you at least are designating your money to where it should go. How can you motivate people to invest? Well, usually people that come to me are motivated, right? And When they come to meet with me, sometimes people have never seen a financial planner before in their life. Some people have experience with maybe their parents know me. So the first thing I do is I do send them out a questionnaire and I do a checklist of what is it that you'd like to talk about. And what that does is it prepares them to really, what do I do? (laughs) Because they don't know. And the second thing is with the questionnaire, I'm asking them, you know, what's the best financial decision you've ever made? What's the worst financial decision you've ever made? Why are you seeing me? What's not working for you right now? That helps me help them because now they're saying, listen, we're making a lot of money, but we're not saving anything. Or we have a 401k, we don't know how to invest in it. We would like to buy a home and We don't know how much we need to put down and we don't know how to save that. So a lot of their questions, a lot of the discussions I have, a lot of the planning has to do with the three buckets. And I'll just do a quick example. I'll say, what's going on in the next year? It's going to cost you money because maybe we should have money ready just in case, right? So we have to have X amount in the bank. Then I'll say, what's coming up in about five years or so? How's your car running? Do you have any home improvements coming up? Is there a big vacation coming up that you're interested in taking? So we start talking about those things. And then you go to the third bucket and say, listen, are you putting money in your 401k? Are you at least putting 10% in your 401k? If you don't have one, are you putting money in an IRA or something? Because retirement is really everybody on this call, all of us. What we're trying to do is we're trying to recreate our income, right? We want to be able to have enough assets to provide us with an income that we don't have to work anymore. So once I start talking about all their goals, and if you're listening to me, you're thinking about what do I have that comes up in the next year? What's going to come up in five years and so on? Guess what? I took away me motivating them. They're motivating themselves because they're looking at what's important to them and they want to save money for those things because those are important things to them. So that takes the whole thing away from me that I have to motivate them. They've just been motivating themselves by writing down all the different things that they want to do that obviously costs money. So Jill, the market cycles go up and down. When the markets turn and your clients are stressed, what is the one thing that you do to stay calm and focused? And how do you help your clients do the same? So my psychology degree sure came in handy because I think I do a lot of behavioral things more than just financial. Because 
you don't do anything when the market goes down. If your goal is to save money for the future, you just keep saving money for the future. Lisa, I know you do some yoga and it's like yoga. You don't look at all this chaos that's going on around you. You stick to what you're trying to do and you stick with that goal. What we do as a company is we call all of our clients. When COVID hit in March, we called every single client and talked to them and They've heard the stories. We give them articles. We talk to them about, listen, your goals haven't changed. Your risk hasn't changed. You need to keep plugging away. I'll say something that might be helpful to all of you, though. The market has patterns or cycles. So they've been measuring the market since 1926, just so you know. And if you look at every 10-year period, and I'm talking 26 to 36, 27 to 37, and so on, Every 10 years, you're going to have seven ups and three downs. That's the pattern. It's not going to be exact. Don't write this down as exactly. But for every 10 years, there's been seven ups, three downs. And out of those three downs, one of them's pretty severe. And if you look back, that's exactly what's been happening. So if you're in the middle of a downturn, number one, it's temporary. And number two, Some people that are young or accumulating, they keep putting more and more money in because that's an opportunity. And for my clients that are retired, they don't need all their money right now. They're just pulling out income, so there's no need to panic. So to answer your question, we just talk it through with all of them. I call it talking them off the ledge. (laughs) I think that's a term from your psychology degree, right, Jill? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) The Chamber has many small business owners. What is the biggest mistake that you think small business owners make when it comes to planning for the future and retirement? So for business owners, thank you, Trish. I would say they keep building and building their business. They take every dime that they make and they put it back in their business because that's where their head and their focus is. And to be honest, wouldn't it be nice to be a little bit diversified and have some other asset or something that's growing that's not your business? So I think that's their biggest mistake. So Jill, for people who do not invest into their retirement funds through their employers, how can they build the retirement portfolio? And are there any limits on how much they can invest each year? So Andrea, I think if they don't have a retirement plan at their work, they should call me and I'll go talk to the owner. <laughs> However, they could put money in an IRA. You could put 6000 a year in an IRA. There's catch up if you're over 50. Also, there are tax shelters they could put money in that will grow that it doesn't get taxed. So that's specifically for retirement. There's products that act like pensions that you could put money in and then it gives you a guaranteed income when you retire if you're not the type that likes to invest. You know, those three questions I mentioned at the beginning of the call, you know, if I get somebody that their answer is fear and they're afraid of running out of money, that's where this product is appropriate, for instance. Jill, are you talking about a SEP or is that something entirely different? I was talking in general of products, but a SEP plan, IRA plan, 401k, 403b, those are titles that you put on an investment. And how an investment is titled is what determines the tax rules or consequences. So all of you could have the same XYZ fund, but John, if yours was in a 401k, well, now we're going to follow the 401k rules and it's a company plan that the company provides for you. And Andrea, if yours is in an IRA, well, then you still have that XYZ company, but now we're going to follow the IRA rules for that. And Lisa, you could have that XYZ fund that's not even in an IRA or a 401k. It's just a regular fund. So yours is liquid and has no tax shelter to it and a lot less rules. And then Trish, you could have yours in a SEP plan, which is a retirement plan for business owners. And so we're going to go under the SEP rules, which kind of falls with IRAs, for instance. So the title that you put on an investment is really what determines the taxes. So Jill, how do you determine a client's risk profile and help them to get started with investing? Simply, I give them a quiz. And I ask them questions like, hey, what if your portfolio went down 20% this month? What would you do? And their answers determine, for me, their investment maturity. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. It's just the longer you've been investing, the more experience you get. It's kind of like going to Cedar Point and going on that roller coaster. And by the 40th ride, you're like, I know what's going to (laughs) happen. (laughs) We're okay. And that's how investing is. You get more experienced and you don't panic so much. You know what's going on. 
I mean, my kids have been trained since they're 10 years old. So to be very honest, I have the opposite view and they have the opposite view of what the public's natural view when the market goes down is they panic like, oh my gosh, my money went down. And the truth is I'm thinking, oh boy, what am I going to buy today? Because I see it as opportunity. Other people see it as, oh my gosh, I lost money. But when I talk to you about those patterns, the 10-year patterns, there's never been a 10-year period that the market has not made money. So if you have 10 years, it's really hardly any risk to just invest the money, hold tight, and let it grow. It reminds me of this Warren Buffett quote, Jill, be fearful when others are greedy, be greedy when others are fearful. I love that quote from him. Well, think of all the people that invested during COVID. Yeah. People are running around like crazy. Think about this too. It might give you some perspective. A lot of this stuff is temporary. You know, COVID's going to be around, but companies are still going to make money regardless, right? Yeah. Nick Murray wrote a book and the analogy in his book was very good. You plant a tree and you don't every year say, oh my gosh, it's bad weather this year. Let's uproot the tree. You just plant the tree, you let it grow, you let it do its thing. It's going to go through its seasons. And then in X amount of years, you've got some shade. And you don't question every year what's going on with the weather and what are we going to do? And you just let it be. Jill, we're recording this on February 19th, and I know nobody has a crystal ball and you can't guarantee any kind of uh, hard prediction for the future. But with the Democrats taking control of the House Senate presidency, and we're certainly not going to talk politics here, but what are some things that we should be watching for overall in the markets in 2021? Okay, I have two answers for you. I'm going to first of all say that I have a piece from American Funds, who's the largest research firm in the world that only shares their research, obviously, with their investors. And it tracked the presidencies and what the market did. And it virtually does not matter who's the president, just for the record. Okay, that's one. Number two, I have just three or four things I want to say, but I'm going to call it investing for the next decade. Long term, there you go. Yep, for the next decade. Because anybody tells you that they know what's going on, my question to them is why aren't they in their yacht in Greece and what are they doing working? I mean, nobody really knows. And if they act like they know, run, don't walk <laughs> away because nobody really does know, okay? But if I talked about a few things investing for the next decade, I wanna say that COVID could be this generation's Pearl Harbor because there was some extreme adversity and what that did is it spurred innovation and a lot of behavioral changes. Cash, that's another that's coming up, a lot of digital payments. This is where the U.S. is way behind with the emerging markets. I don't think people will be exchanging money in the future, uh, cash dollars. It's going to be all digital. Um, cancer cure. With cell therapy, they think that most cancers will be cured or at least a lot of innovation on that by 2030. So there's a lot of healthcare innovation. There's breakthroughs in diagnostics, early detection of illness. There's drugs that are more effective couple more. One is renewable energy. I mean, things are going electric, folks, and there's a lot of renewable and green energy going on, artificial intelligence, automation. Right now, utilities are over 30% renewable right now. And you have the electrical and the autonomous vehicles going on. And the last thing I'll say is what's not changing? Successful investing. There's always going to be companies that are creating and innovating and making money and improving our lives. And so I would concentrate on where are we going to make money and not on the politics and not on all the short-term stuff. That's not really important. All right, Jill. So now it's time for our fishbowl question segment where we ask you a very random question. Andrea, will you pull the fishbowl question of the day? Jill, if you were a Disney character, which one would you be? That is so easy. I should hold up my phone for all of you. Tigger. <laughs> and why? I love Tigger. He's got a lot of energy. He's always bouncing around. He annoys everybody. And that's who I am. <laughs> so my, I mean, my husband just, um, it drives him crazy because I always have a lot of energy. And he's like, could you just go run around the block a couple times and then come back? And I said, sure. So I think it is much better for a financial advisor and financial planner to be Tigger than Eeyore. I will say that. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's true. T I double G er. Well, Jill Gleba from Gleba and Associates, we want to thank you for being on the podcast today. If somebody wants to get a hold of you and talk to you about their finances and planning their future, what are the best ways to find you? 
Oh, you can go to glebaandassociates.com. You can call our office, 248-879-4510. Look up Jill Gleba. I'm sure you'll find me on the internet. Sounds like a plan. We want to thank all of you for listening today. I am John Gay from Jag in Detroit Podcast. You can find my podcast business at jagindetroit.com. My name is Andrea Arndt. I am an intellectual property attorney at Dickinson Wright and help my clients protect their inventions and build their brands. My name is Lisa Bibby. I'm a realtor with Keller Williams, and I put the real back in realtor. You can follow me on Facebook at Sold by Lisa B. I'm Trish from Your Personal Jeweler, and you guys can connect with me on Instagram and Facebook at The Personal Jeweler. We want to thank you for listening to The Rock Pod. It's a production of the Royal Oak Chamber of Commerce. You can subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you find your shows, and we'll talk to you next time.